Hey, Drew Dixon here, wanting to encourage you again during this wonderful time we're all sharing of the coronavirus. Um, it's a frustrating time, right? And so one of the things we've been talking about as a staff at Lovely Nerd is how can we give back? How can we help people cope during this time? And one of the simplest ways we can do that is just through trying to give people some hope. We want to, we realize this is a frustrating time. We realize this is a time when a lot of people um, are really worried about the future and really worried about health. We're really worried about public health. We're really worried about our own health. We're really worried about uh, our jobs and our security. And there's a lot to be concerned about. And so this is a time when we've got to band together. We've got to encourage one another. We've got to stand side by side. So whether you're a nerd or not, that's what these videos are designed to do. We just want to offer some hope. We want to do whatever we can to encourage people to spread hope and to spread hope to you. So I don't know what you're going through or what's going on in your life right now, but um, I do know that words are powerful. I do know that there are things, there are little things that we can all do to band together and fight this virus. And just as important as it is that we um, keep some social distance between each other, that we follow the guidelines set by our local governments and state governments and national government to fight this disease, it's just as important that we don't lose hope. It's just as important that we use our words to encourage one another and to build each other up so that we don't lose hope in the midst of this. So that's what I want to do today. I want to read a little passage from the Bible that um, actually recently was preached at the church, the local church that we attend in the Nashville area. Um, and it just stuck with me. And this is actually a passage that um, is kind of uh, stuck with me in many ways because it's so uh, devastating. Um, but I promise I'm going to say something super encouraging through this. So this is kind of a devastating passage about, about words but I promise I'm not going to say devastating things about it. I hope what I have to say from it will lift you up and give you hope. So this is the book of James, and I'm going to read from verse 2, uh, chapter 3, verse 2. So James 3, starting in verse 2, For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is mature, able also to control the whole body. Now if we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we direct their whole bodies. And consider ships. Though very large and driven by fierce winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So too, though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts great things. Consider how small a fire sets ablaze a large forest. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a world of unrighteousness, and it is placed among members. It stains the whole body, sets the course of life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Every kind of animal, bird, reptile, and fish is tamed and has been tamed by humankind, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God's likeness. Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Does a spring pour forth sweet and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree produce olives? My brothers and sisters, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt water spring yield fresh water. Are you encouraged? <laughs> this passage doesn't give us a lot of hope about the way we tend as human beings to use words. And you're probably experiencing a lot of this right now, right? There's a lot of people on your Facebook feed or your Twitter feed who are just like doom and gloom, right? Things are terrible right now and they seem to be getting worse. And that's probably getting in your headspace and making you feel discouraged. Um, or perhaps there are people that are just like partying it up and they don't care, they don't give a crap about coronavirus and they're not gonna change their lifestyle for a second. Um, and they're bragging about it and being uh, real real jerks about it on, on social media. Um, that's really frustrating too, right? There's all kinds of ways that we've learned to hurt each other with our words, but I kinda wanna flip that for a minute, if you don't mind. I know that this passage is really clear about how dangerous the way we tend to speak can be in terms of how it impacts other people. And by the way, when I've heard this passage preached, that's usually what it's focused on, right? Is here's X, Y, and Z ways we tend to use our words to destroy other people and to hurt God and our relationship with God and our relationship with other people. I've heard a lot of sermons where this was used to hammer on the danger of four-letter words, right? That's not what this passage is about. This passage is about how powerful our words are. And so if it's true, if what this passage says about words is true, and I think, listen, we know it is, don't we? 
think about it. Just think about it for a minute. Like you remember some of the most profound things people have said to you or about you. The things people say, you know, we make up these jingles like sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. We know that's not true because we remember the most profound things people say. Like we remember when someone said, I don't love you anymore. Or we remember when someone said, I'm disappointed in you. Or when someone said to us, um, you know, this really awful thing. We hold the, we hold on to those things and we remember them. But think about this too. We remember powerful words of encouragement people speak to us, right? We remembered when our mom or dad said, you can do it. I believe in you. We remember when our spouse says, I love you. We remember when our children say, I love you more than you love me. My kids say that all the time. Um, and it's not true, first of all, but they do say it a lot. Um, I'll never forget this moment when um, my, my middle child, Gwyneth was really young and she was going through this phase where she just wanted mommy, 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 right? And she never wanted me to help her with anything. It was driving Jennifer crazy because she was super clingy to Jennifer and I could never be the one to help Gwyneth uh, change her diaper. She didn't want me to change her diaper. She didn't want me to comfort her when she was upset. She didn't want me to help her at night, you know, when she was going to bed, like it was, she wanted Jennifer all the time. And there was one time when Gwyneth was upset and I was trying to calm her down and I was holding her, trying to calm her down sweetly, you know, you know, rocking her, uh, trying to calm her down. She's probably like two or so. Um, and she just got so upset. She said, I don't want daddy. I don't want daddy. And she was just yelling this. I don't want daddy. And like, it finally just got to me, right? Um, it finally just broke me. And I remember like, um, I'd like to say I'm, I, I'm wise enough to know that this was just a phase and like any parenting expert would tell you this, like kids just go through these phases where they want one parent or the other, especially when they're super young. And I should have known that that was the case and I shouldn't have worried about it, but it just broke me, right? And I went into the bedroom, shut the door and just bawled, just like wept uh, out of frustration and insecurity and, and, and everything else. And my daughter, my older daughter, Evelyn, she was probably like five at the time. She comes into the room and she says, I want you, daddy. Gwyneth had been saying, I don't want daddy. I don't want daddy. I don't want daddy. And, and my older child, my, my, my five-year-old, Evelyn, she's now eight, but she walks in and she says, I want you, daddy. And I remember I just, I cried even more and even harder because uh, of how powerful those words were in that moment. Um, and the opposite of what James says about words is true too. Just as words are deadly and can be poisonous and can really destroy and hurt people, they can lift people up and empower them to do things they never thought they could do. Your words, I want you to know, have the power to lift people up in the midst of this tragic time that we all find ourselves in. Your words are incredibly powerful. They contain so much potential to change the world for the better, to change your world, to change the world of your family members, to change the world of your neighbors. So I just wanna challenge you, don't waste your words during this time. Um, I've been trying to think a lot about who can I encourage today? Uh, who can I speak a word uh, uh, of just appreciation. Just think about the ways the people in your life matter to you. I've been thinking a lot about that since the coronavirus started and we've been quarantined. Um, I've been talking to my parents a lot more. I've been um, trying to think of ways just like get on Facebook or call someone and just tell them why I'm appreciative of them. Think how powerful that could be for someone. And think about the people who are maybe most affected by this, really, by the quarantine uh, that we're all in. Think about the people in your life who are single, who don't have family members that are living with them that they can lean on. Um, think about people who um, are elderly and just can't get out at all. I mean, at least I get to go to the grocery store every now and then. Um, and, and those people who are really worried right now, think about how you could just be there for them. A phone call, a Marco Polo, a text message, if we'll just let each other know we're in this together, we're praying for each other. Um, maybe you know someone who's in a really bad financial situation. If you just call them and let them know they're not alone in this, your words matter. They have great power. Um, they can flip the script for people. So don't waste them during this time. Let's use our words to build people up. Let's use our words to spread hope. Let's use our words to spread love. That's what Love Entered is all about, right? 
being the love of Jesus to nerds and nerd culture. So I hope you know um, your words matter and you are loved. You are valued. You matter. And if you don't matter to anyone else, I hope you know that you matter to us at Love I Nerd and you matter to God. Jesus loves you, nerd. See you next time.